Singapore is a low-lying island and city-state. 80% of its population live in high-rise public housing, resulting in one of the highest population densities in the world. Challenges from rapid urbanization, sea level rise, and an increasingly chaotic climate is forcing planners and architects and policymakers to respond to critical questions about how cities of the future will cope with growing demand. Despite the growing pressure on space, Singapore has been dubbed Asia's greenest city. So I've come here to meet some of the people who are helping it earn that title. My first stop is the Park Royal Hotel, which boasts 15,000 square meters of greenery and was completed in 2013 by award-winning architect Richard Hassel. The earth now in almost every way is being formed by human activity. So for us as architects, we feel like it's something within our control to suggest ways that Building projects can also play a much stronger role in this stewardship of the Earth. When you look at like Google Earth or images from space, cities are really deserts. You know, you see a very bright, white, shiny area surrounded by dark vegetation. If people build buildings like this, you would no longer see that. You would see the, the vegetation layer covering the city as well. The Singaporean government awarded Park Royale its coveted platinum green mark the nation's highest environmental certification. is part of a wider scheme to promote environmentally friendly buildings and investment into green city solutions. To understand more about why this city is the greenest in Asia, I want to see what's happening at the grassroots. I've heard about a non-profit across town that's providing environmental education and supporting a growing eco-community. I've come to meet the founder, Lai Hock. Welcome, man. I came here trying to get people to go back to basic. And I thought as a result of that, with urbanization, globalization, and digitization, that we become disconnect. So I was trying to create, using a space to connect back people and to bring back the spirit of the community. And it's very strange for a country like Singapore because we're so top down. And that's why my name is called Ground Up Initiative. The Ground Up Initiative started in 2009 and secured a piece of land to provide environmental education for people of all ages. It now runs several workshops and seminars, building a community of environmentally engaged citizens. Like if, if, if you just for a moment forgot that we we're in the middle of Singapore, <laughs> there is, they're just knocking down your door, aren't they? In fact, they want to build on this land, that too. And I told the government to give me a chance to prove that I think Singapore needs a different kind of space. 50% of the world population now live in cities. And 70% will live out of 9.3 billion or 9.5 billion in a 30 years time. What do you think will become? Where is the food coming from? Who wants to work on the land? Who will clean the rubbish for you? All these are environmental issues. In the Ground Up Initiative Gardens, I meet Choi Fen and Ka Hui, volunteers who've come along to get their hands dirty. Why do you come here? Doing farming, in a way, um, get me more connected with um, what we are actually doing every day because when we eat food, we know wh exactly where they come from. And in Singapore, I realise um, also people don't appreciate food because um, maybe to the kids, they have never seen this, how the fruit is grown. Maybe they thought it's just from the supermarket. Places like this is very good because it makes us go back to the basics. What keeps us surviving? What makes us thrive? And it's not really about having money. It's not really about having all the tech stuff, but really being able to to understand that you are just big, what a part of this bigger ecosystem. Seeing how things are grown, for example, it makes me start to ask a lot of other questions like how, where things come from. So if I use a paper, I start to think, so where is it from? Um, and if I throw it away, where is it going? Ka Hui is committed to reducing her waste to almost zero. We go back to her flat to see how she's getting on. This is the last place that you would expect to see a little permaculture garden going on in somebody's front room. I just started this journey barely a year ago. So a lot of things are, to me are experiments. You are here on your own, you're experimenting with all this. How do you, are you kind of creating a network here? Because you can't be the only person in Singapore uh, thinking like yeah, this. Yeah, right? um, when I started the groups on Facebook, it was sometimes frustrating because I seem to be the only person who keep posting. But um, now I think it's at least 3,500. And 
That's great. It's quite surprising. I think when we see individuals taking just a small action to me, it's very encouraging because they start to take this ownership. Kahui and the Journey to Zero Waste community still have a long way to go. Last year, Singapore's 5.5 million population ditched over 7.5 million tonnes of waste. That's one and a half tonnes per person. But momentum is building and similar grassroots projects are sprouting up throughout the city. So we met Choi Fen earlier at the Ground Up Initiative and she's invited us to come across town and have a look at her own community garden. How are you? Oh, so this is your project? Yeah. My neighbours who come and spend time here in the garden actually doing stuff. They are directors, they are um, CEOs, um, lawyers. Is that, is that edamame? Is that soy? I've never seen soybeans grow before. I feel that a lot of the urban spaces in Singapore should not be horticulture landscape, it should be foodscape. And how can we truly make Singapore maybe a, a city in a food garden? Why does it need to just be a small one, you know, that only serves a few people in the community? Why not the larger community? Over 80% of the food consumed in Singapore is imported, so the Ministry of National Development is investing heavily in boosting food production on the island. I've arranged to meet Jack Ng, an engineer turned food producer who's taking commercial scale urban farming to the next level. Well, I can say I've never seen a farm like this before. Uh, yes, we are first in the world. First in the world, yes, yeah. commercial. For, for someone that's never heard of a vertical farm, how do you describe something like this? Uh, Singapore is a landscape, so we don't have uh, much of land to uh, produce vegetables. Singaporeans, we stay in a HDB fat, means it's vertically. So you look at why vegetable agriculture cannot go vertically. Currently, our system is using the hydraulics, uh, using water, make it this tower rotating. So plant can go up and get uh, enough sunlight, come out, get uh, nutrients and water. So, and the water is a sim water, make it rotating. It's a sim water also given to the plant. And the water will be keep on uh, recycle, use it. So far, we know how to change the water at all. So far, you've not changed it at yes, all? Wow. Yes. That's quite something, given that this farm's been operating for three years. These rotating shelves effectively increase the land surface area by a factor of 10, meaning this vertical farm can produce two tons of vegetables in a single day. Meet Nai Pai, king of the veggies. It's a beauty, isn't it? Oh, look, there's a weed. That's the first weed I've seen in the, in the entire place. This is to attract the pests. Insect, yeah. And then they, they're stunned on these bars, and then, but there's none in there. I mean... It means that it's, the pest management is good. Then even the pests, after we catch them, we are fixed to our fish. This is brilliant. So we're actually, this is floating. This is, com this is... Yes, completely floating. Completely floating. Jack, why have you created a floating greenhouse in a pond? We need pond to keep water for our vegetable. So what I do, if you build more pond, actually less area for our system. So what I do, can we build a pond at the same time we have a plant? So what we concept is, uh, it's the same area, we have two production. One harvest of fish for every six harvests yeah. of vegetables. Correct. The fish are feeding the vegetables, yes. and the vegetables are in a sense can, feeding the fish. Can feed the fish. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the trimmings from the vegetables are actually going to feed the fish yes. as well. And using is the same size of the land, but have two polar. Wow. Yes. Being located within the city, these high-density aquaponic setups are also saving energy on transportation and storage. So it's little wonder that Sky Greens have garnered widespread interest throughout Asia, as well as with the Singaporean government who continue to support the development of the technology. I've come back to the Woha offices to learn more about their living buildings and what lies ahead for Asia's greenest city. This project, for instance, when it's fully grown, will have 11 times the site area as green area. So why go to all this extra effort to, to swaddle your buildings in plants? A huge one in a hot climate like Singapore is that plants are the only thing that when the sunlight falls on it, they don't heat up. They actually take that energy and use it for their chemical processes of building carbohydrates and things. So the calculation for Singapore, for instance, is that before the city was built, Singapore was five degrees cooler. And all that heat ends up 
being converted into uh, fossil fuel use as people use air conditioners to cool the space and throw even more heat out into the city. If substantial plant cover even reduced Singapore by uh, two or three degrees Celsius, the energy saving for the entire country would be you know, in the billions of dollars over, over years. A lot of the argument people have that, oh, so much of the city's built, you know, it doesn't matter one or two buildings, what difference can they make? Mm. But if one building can compensate for 10 other sites not having any green, you can see that just by doing selective uh, uh, injection of these kind of buildings through the city, you can already create a statistically significant amount of green in the city. Can you see potentially in the future where you could uh, actually see some of this area providing uh, a food supplement? Because we know that Singapore is Definitely. so reliant on food imports. Yeah. We've sort of done generation one, which is providing a lot of planting and achieving these plot ratios. I think generation two is, uh, OK, now we have this. What can we do with it? And that's where I think there's anything you do on land on the ground, you can start thinking, does it make sense to do that up high on a building? So, you know, food or we're also very interested in ecosystems. You know, can we make it not just decorative, but can we make it very biologically productive? We can, like in our lifetime, how many buildings can we build? This is something that needs lots of people doing it. And it needs rethinking at the uh, urban planning level and at whole city visioning. So we've come up to the Skyville at Dawson, which is one of Richard's public housing projects. And it does feel great. I mean, the, the planting design and this shady canopy of solar panels it feels lovely. But I mean, looking out at the view, it's pretty terrifying. It's not just the density, but it's the number of housing and, and building development projects. And it's this kind of armada of oil tankers and shipping containers that stretches to the horizon in almost every direction. But when you start to look at that horizon through Richard's eyes and you see the potential for a rooftop aquaponics setup, a vertical forest, you know, you start to have hope. But for us to make that future a reality, then it means getting the grassroots engaged. It means that Choi, Fen, and Ka Hui and all those guys are getting things going from the ground up. And it means they're meeting the planners and the policymakers halfway if we're going to see cities that are truly sustainable. <laughs>